Greg? Thank you very much, Sterling. Uh, let me get this thing rolling. And uh, we're gonna have the, there we are. Uh, so uh, he introduced my title as manipulating science, sloppy work. He said, or scientific malfeasance. On the advice of my attorney, I've changed that to scientific bias instead of malfeasance. Because well, actually it was on the advice of David Legates. So thank you, David. I think I'll, uh, so what we're, I'm gonna talk today, I, I thought about, I wanted to do something different. Uh, and I was thinking what it was. Uh, and one of the things was, as I was researching my next book, one of the things that struck me, I had a section in it, it's in three parts. The first section is on unusual and unprecedented warming. And as I was going through and researching the evidence, I was just struck by just the horrible, horrible science that was that's being used to justify this notion of unusual and unprecedented warming. Just time after time, uh, truncations, manipulating data, cherry picking, uh, creating data, using data upside down. So I, I thought it might be good to just look through just quickly the highlights, or maybe we'd call it the lowlights of some of these big, um, what are called replication studies uh, supporting uh, Michael Mann's hockey stick. And, I, and then I'll throw in a couple of the uh, alarmism masquerading at science at the end. So of course we've got, I'm not gonna deal too much on the hockey stick. Michael Mann kicked this off with this notion of unusual unprecedented warming. Uh, 900 years of slowly declining temperature, of course, we are, we're all familiar with this. And then escalating temperatures alarmingly going into the 20th century. Um, and what it, this, this is really an important discussion that we have to have because if indeed temperatures are unusual and unprecedented over the scale of thousands of years, and we have something we haven't seen in thousands of years, that would lend great support to the notion that CO2 is driving temperature increases over the last 80 or 90 years. Uh, if on the other hand, our temperatures today aren't unusual, they're not unprecedented, but rather we see in particular the medieval warm period, uh, that it's actually as warmer, warmer than today, then that's a strong argument backing those of us that support na nature being the primary driver uh, of, of temperature changes. And what we see, as I look through all of these studies going one way or the other, the errors and the mistakes that were made all go in one direction. They reduce the warming of the medieval warm period and increase the temperature of the Little Ice Age. Um, what are the odds of that happening? Uh, not very good uh, for all the mistakes to go in one direction. Um, so the, the big pushback on this, of course, came by from Steve McIntyre, uh, aided by Ross McKittrick uh, back, uh, this, this dates back Mann's papers from 98 and 99. Uh, they came back and just blew it up uh, and identified a huge amount of mistakes in Michael Mann's work. Uh, truncation of data, obsolete data, uh, just, just one, a litany of things one after another, just horrible mistakes uh, within these studies. Uh, two of the biggest things that, that, that Michael Mann used for the hockey stick was incorrect statistical methods um, in analysis and analyzing the statistical data that tended to produce hockey sticks no matter what the data was inputted, which would be a, a good boon if you want to create hockey sticks, you need a statistical me method that generates them. Um, and the second big thing that we see repeated in all the, a lot of the replication studies of his work is this reliance on invalid proxy data in particular strip bark, strip bark chronologies of tree ring data, uh, mostly bristlecone pines. Um, and, and this reliance on the bristlecone pine ring data, um, the authors of that study, Graybill and Idso, they stated in their very study that the tree ring increase, which man interpreted as being related to temperature was actually related to increases in CO2. Um, uh, but he used it anyhow. And again, we see these, these strip, the same chronology used time and time again after that. Uh, it's been, their work, McIntyre and McKittrick's work was backed up in two big studies. Uh, the Congressional Wegman report uh, said that McIntyre and McKittrick's uh, uh, arguments were compelling and valid. Uh, and also they, they backed it up, they said that modern warming uh, 
cannot be supported by his analysis. This is an actual congressional report that was done. And then uh, Dr. Michael Fox uh, said, we're either dealing with willful scientific deceptions or woeful and lazy scientific mediocrity from PhDs themselves. This is relating to the people talking about the hockey stick. Uh, but it's a recurring theme. After the hockey stick, there were a number of what are called replication studies. In other words, they replicated uh, more hockey sticks. Uh, most of those, I'm going to break them up, and they're, they're really two cl classifications. There are the early replication studies in the 2000s, early 2000s, late 2000s. Uh, then we got the we go into the 2010, 2013, those are later replication studies, the page is 2K. Uh, but a lot of these still rely on the same flawed uh, tree ring proxies. And tree rings are okay to use as a proxy. Uh, a lot of you are very knowledgeable, but just for those of you who aren't, you can use, what you want to do with a tree ring, if you're going to use it for temperature, you want to do it in the, the very high latitudes where it's cold or the very high altitudes where it's cold. So you want Apologies to Jimmy Buffett, so it's talking about changes in latitudes, changes in altitudes uh, for these. So, uh, but if you don't do that, there are other things that drive tree ring growth data. Uh, the big thing with this too is the we see with the people that use dendrochronology or tree rings, uh, they're able to cherry pick the data. And what they can do is pick out the tree ring data that suits their purposes. And if you find tree rings that go against modern warming, well, you just get rid of those. Uh, and and uh, Roseanne Di Dorigo famously said, uh, you have to pick cherries if you want to make cherry pie. And they're very kind of proud of this. That um, So obviously, if these tree rings don't agree with modern day warming, oh, there must be something wrong with the data. Um, uh, and Steve McIntyre calls this ex post screening. So what they do is look at large data sets and then only cull out the tree ring data that supports this notion of unusual and unprecedented warming. Um, so the ability to choose and pick which samples to use is an advantage unique to dendrochronology. So uh, if you can pick the data set closely and just pick out the ones that show unusual and unprecedented warming, I think you'll tend to get unusual and unprecedented warming. Um, uh, and finally, uh, Gordon Jacoby, he admitted, he says, if, if we get a good climactic story from a chronology, we write a paper using it, that's our funded mission. So that's where the funding's driving this. Um, and then we get to replicating the hockey stick. Uh, you see all these headlines, largest warming in 2,000 years, 1,000 years, whatever it is. These head they, they gather headlines. Uh, and... Uh, a lot of these early replication studies, uh, the studies' names are at the top, uh, the various uh, proxy data is on the left, and the red boxes are, are the ones used. Well, a lot of these were just, if we, we went through, and in the book I'm going through uh, detailing what was wrong with each of these studies that they used to, to document this, uh, and many of these were used, and most of these were used in the same study after study. Uh, if we took, for example, the polar urals, we just looked at uh, we just looked at, and that's the top one there. Uh, it was used in all of these early studies. Well, uh, the first one, this is what was used. This is the polar Ural study data of tree rings uh, showing that the medieval warm period was the coldest over uh, in, in 1,000 years. Uh, and uh, it was Steve McIntyre looked at it and he said, well, it's just like really bad data and it should never have been used. That was confirmed with an updated study adding 20 years of data, that in fact the good data that was re recovered uh, showed that actually the medieval warm period uh, was the warmest in 1,000 years or more. Uh, the, other, the other one that was used in all the studies was called Tornatrask. Uh, and again, it was uh, uh, an era, that just a bad data set. Uh, that was used. And again, Steve, Steve McIntyre is a hero to me. He's just, he's, he was the one who went and discovered most of these problems. Um, but they can continue, continue to use one flawed study after another. Uh, the Pages 2K network, it, it stands for Past Global Changes. Um, it's the de facto wing, wing of the hockey team. And so you've probably, if you've not seen the studies themselves, you've seen the headlines uh, in the paper. 
Um, the first one was in 2013. Again, uh, unusual and unprecedented warming. Uh, they looked at seven continent-wide reconstructions. Um, and here are six of the seven. I want you to look close. I'm going to leave this up for just a little bit. I want you to look at each, six of the seven continent-wide reconstructions. Do any of those look unusual or unprecedented to you? They don't to me, not a one of them. Um, and, but yet, the overall reconstruction that he did of global temperatures showed a hockey stick with unusual and unprecedented warming. And that's because that was being driven by the Arctic data, uh, which is shown here, which shows a clear hockey stick. Um, when we went back, Steve McIntyre went back and looked at it. For number one, it was really big, being driven by two studies. Uh, Han, Han Jarvi from Iceland took the data and used it upside down. So instead, yes, they turned the data completely upside down. And of course, what, what should have been cold was now warm. What should have been warm is now cold. Um, the other was in a Gallicu Lake sediment. That's in Greenland. That's a Actually, Eric the Red lived close to where that building is right there. Uh, the lake sediments are used. The theory is that uh, during really cold times, snow builds up for a long time over the, over the winter. There's a large snow accumulation. And then in the spring, we have much larger runoff, and there's more sediment in the lake. Well, in this case, um, they didn't take into account modern farming. There's a couple things you can do, too, to in increase uh, sediment. For example, I, I call it the Viking bump. You see right the, kind of in the middle there. Right? That's when Eric the Red and the rest of his bu buddies uh, started farming along the edge of this lake. And of course, if you're farming, you're going to get more sediment. And then we have the modern day our agricultural practices that the study they used actually said that's what's causing this. Uh, when he went back and, and reevaluated this, the top one was the original, showing the unusual and unprecedented warming in the hockey stick. The bottom, they, they actually had to publish. I'm not sure the pronoun an, an incorrectum will happen will correct me there, but uh, or David, but uh, they they published a correction to this. This is the corrected date on the bottom. Uh, again, we see the little ice age. Um, we see a we see a medieval warm period, and we see warming today. But the but the temperatures during the middle medieval, medieval warm period uh, were warmer than they are today. And and, rem and this is the this is the final reconstruction. Um, of that data, again, showing warmer today, which we're in a warming trend. I think we all admit that. Uh, but it shows uh, nothing unusual about the warming that we're in, nothing compared to, to the medieval uh, warm period. Uh, but you remember whenever this was published, there were huge headlines screaming unusual, nothing like this has been seen in thousands of years. Uh, of course, it was this, the correction was buried, and no one ever saw it. Uh, one of the worst ones is the Marcotte reconstruction that's shown uh, I see it on Facebook a lot in the in media. This thing's posted just horrible, horrible. Uh, our, my friend Willie Soon here has talked about it. Uh, uh, but uh, this, uh, Marcot published his PhD dissertation, which is at the bottom, uh, showing no unusual warming. He published uh, reconstruction a couple years later, showing a huge warming. Uh, global temperature highest in 4,000 years. Uh, and, and, and Will, uh, Willie Soon came out, they used this, this, the Australian Cicero used this study to document something. Uh, Dr. Soon came out, said, trying to say this paper is legitimate and can be used as supporting scientific evidence is scientific malpractice. So again, we see time after time. And his, he, he relied on this unusual and unprecedented warming to one data point. And actually, in the, in the actual data, it never even showed up. The one data point driving this wasn't even in the, in the data provided. Um, another of the later pages, 2K, relied heavily on tree ring data. Uh, that first one we looked at, pages 2013, uh, used tree ring data. He, he took 124 of the samples of tree rings that were used in the first study and just erased them. And the reasoning was they're flawed. They have to be flawed because they're not showing warming, modern warming. All right, what do you do when something doesn't agree with your data? The solution too many times is just get rid of it. Uh, Kaufman 2020, one of the more recent ones. Uh, again, now, now they're up to 6,500 years of cooling. Uh, we've, never, uh, we've never seen anything like this in that time frame. One of the things driving this was this uh, 
uh, Dahl Jensen data that was used. Uh, he, he used it uh, upside, he, he took the data on the left is from Dahl Jensen's study. And these, these are the years on the left. He took that data, inverted it, and then posted it into the modern data. Uh, that was documented. And that's what drove, that's, that's why those two curves look so dissimilar. The one on the left is the original Dahl Jensen data. The one on the right, again from Steve McIntyre, um, uh, is, is the actually the, the data that was used in the study. Just horrific abuses, and I'll, I'll quickly go through this here. Uh, the, the other thing I, we look at, there's so many of these studies, and I'm gonna pick out two of them that, were, that just jumped out at me. Uh, I think Patrick Moore will talk about it tonight, but uh, the UN report reported there'd be one million species at risk of extinction. Well, that would require 25,000 to 30,000 species to go extinct every single year over the next several decades. And this is the chart they included in the report, the UN report, looking pretty alarming. That looks pretty scary to me, but look closely. There are, there are only five data points. They took one data point per century to create this chart. Well, I went back and actually went back to the, looked at the same data. I looked at it on a decadal basis. Every, I gathered it every 10 years to look at this to find that extinctions peaked in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And since the late 1800s, extinctions have been in significant decline. Remember, the UN said we're gonna have 25,000 to 30,000 species go extinct every year. You know what it's been for the last 40 years? Two. Not 2,000, not 200, two species have gone extinct according to the IUCN red list. Completely different, they manipulated, they didn't manipulate the data, what they did was abuse the statistical methodology to get the result they wanted. Uh, and then just final, final fin fin finishing up here, the fourth national climate assessment dealt with fire. Um, this is the chart they used to support it. Area burned, looks pretty alarming to me. And I, there was no source of reference in this national climate report. I went back, I found where it was coming from. It was the uh, National Interagency Fire Center data. What they did was cherry pick the last several decades of data. Instead of showing the entire chart, they, they cherry picked that data and then increased the y-axis to make it look even worse. Um, and, and when we talk about misconduct in science, this is what uh, National Academies of Science have to say about misconduct. Uh, I'm not accusing any of these scientists referenced here of having misconduct, but uh, they need to be a little bit more careful with their data and, and how they use it. Uh, and again, just finishing up here, uh, I urge you to go to the new CO2 Coalition website. We've got a lot of great data there. So uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Next up is Jay Lair. Thank you, Sterling.